at least 69% of agriculture-driven deforestation is illegal. If this illegal conversion were a country, its greenhouse gas emissions would be equivalent to the total fossil fuel emissions of India in 2018. And it would be the third Whoa. largest country behind the U.S. and China in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. That is absolutely staggering. Welcome to Nature Breaking, a World Wildlife Fund podcast focused on the news and trends affecting our natural world and the people and species who call it home. I'm Seth Larson. Now, earlier this year, we spent a whole episode of this show talking about the Tropical Forest and Coral Reef Conservation Act and how successful it's been over the last 25 years in protecting critical ecosystems around the globe. Today, we're going to focus on a piece of legislation that is yet to become law, but which could offer similar benefits if lawmakers can get it over the finish line. I'm talking about the Fostering Overseas Rule of Law and Environmentally Sound Trade Act, which is a real mouthful, so I'll just stick with its acronym and call it the FOREST Act for short. This legislation would create new requirements and incentives for companies to ensure that the products they import into the U.S. are not associated with illegal deforestation. This matters now more than ever because forests are a critical ally in our global fight against climate change and biodiversity loss and because we're still losing forests far too quickly. Last year, we lost about 10 soccer fields worth of forest every minute. We've got to reverse that trend, and the Forest Act can help. Joining me to talk about this today is Stephanie Kappa, WWF's Director for Policy and Government Affairs. Stephanie's going to tell us all about the Forest Act and how it would work, and where it currently stands in Congress. Stephanie will also give us a quick update on some other priority legislation for this year, including the Farm Bill. So here's my conversation with Stephanie. All right, I am joined now by Stephanie Kappa, WWF's Director for Policy and Government Affairs. Stephanie, welcome to Nature Breaking. Thank you, Seth. Good to be here. So let's start with some context on this. I mentioned in my intro that we lost about 10 soccer fields worth of forest every minute in 2023. And at least some of that can be traced back to illegal deforestation, right? So I wanted to ask you first, what do we mean when we say illegal deforestation and what's driving it? Thanks, Seth. I think it's worth starting out by just focusing on the fact that the loss of global forests is an enormous problem. And just to get a sense of that scale, um, we are seeing that two thirds of global forest cover loss is occurring in tropical, subtropical regions of the world. And WWF has taken a look at this in the last few years and identified 24 of these deforestation fronts, sort of hotspots, that are really the epicenter of forest loss around the world. And found that they are really concentrated okay. in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in Southeast Asia. So global problem that really starts to drill down into specific regions around the world. Drilling gotcha. down even further is that the biggest single driver of this tropical forest loss is the expansion of commercial agriculture. And that's led by cattle and soy production in South America, by palm oil and pulp production in Southeast Asia. But it also includes other commodities that you and I use every day, cocoa, coffee, rubber, that are used in an ever increasing list of products that you and I use every day. So that's animal feed, lipstick, biofuels. So this is a major problem. We know it, it's a major problem for nature because land use change for agricultural production is the primary driver of global nature loss. This is a problem for the climate where a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, forestry, and land use change. And it's a problem for people because global economies, local livelihoods, human health, and well-being are all dependent on healthy forests around the world. Thank you for, for explaining that a little bit, and I'll let you finish your point in a second. But um, I I think that's interesting to to point out that it's driven so much by agriculture because I think a lot of people think about forest loss and um, we think about what products trees can be used for, and you think about like paper products, and sh like that's probably driving a, a big chunk of this. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that 
around the world, agricultural fields are created by cutting down forests. I, I, I think that's maybe, that was surprising to me when I came to know that a few years ago. And I think a lot of people, that might be counterintuitive that you're taking down one sort of um, green space to make room for a different green space but that in the process of doing that, it's terrible for forests and for habitats, for animals and ecosystems and uh, all the greenhouse gases that emits when you cut down those trees and everything. Yeah, because that is the next sort of level deeper. Um, And to your point, it really is staggering that so much of global ecosystem loss is really connected to the single driver of agricultural production. An additionally staggering fact is that much of this deforestation for agricultural production is actually illegal. And we saw Mm -hmm. some reporting coming out in the last few years that really put a finer point on this. And the takeaway number here is that at least 69% of agriculture driven deforestation is illegal. And that's a forest trends wow. analysis. So it is a staggering percentage. And so to your earlier question, what is the definition of illegal deforestation? That's when you have this conversion of forest ecosystems that takes place in violation of a country's own laws. And so that's national, that's local level. Um, what that looks like on the ground, it can be clearing forests from a protected area or an indigenous territory. It can be engaging in corruption or bribery. So there's not only this environmental damage, this climate, this nature loss, there is a criminal element. So this illegal deforestation fuels illegality, it fuels corruption, and it undermines the rule of law in producer countries. And I think just another statistic to leave you with and and the listeners with, You know, if this illegal conversion were a country, its greenhouse gas emissions would be equivalent to the total fossil fuel emissions of India in 2018. And it it would be the third largest country behind the U.S. and China in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. That is absolutely staggering. That is staggering. It's shocking. Um, I, and I'm surprised, yeah, that number is not more well known. Uh, so you have this this incredible um, size of this impact and this criminality, um, illegality element. And this enters into uh, these commodities that are produced on illegally deforested lands. They enter into global supply chains and there and then you know, our country, our supermarkets, our homes, we use them every day. And that exposes major markets like the United States to environmental human rights abuses, corruption, organized crime. And it frankly undercuts companies and producers that are trying to source legally and responsibly and playing by the rules. So no surprise that the United States has a significant Um, Market share is a significant importer of commodities like palm oil and cattle, cocoa, wood pulp, and rubber that are driving um, deforestation and illegal deforestation around the world. And so the United States has a significant opportunity to change how products are sourced and uh, protect these critical ecosystems and communities around the world. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So that's a lot to take in. I think that really does get to explaining how, you know, when we talk about protecting forests as a climate solution, that's this is not like a drop in the bucket part of the solution. Forest loss is a huge contributor to global greenhouse gases, and there are all sorts of problems that come along with that. And the U.S. is definitely a major part of the solution in terms of addressing it. So that brings us back to the Forest Act. And I wanted to talk about um, sort of the theory of change behind this legislation. And it gets to what you just talked about, the fact that agriculture is driving so much of this and companies are uh, driving agriculture because they want to produce products that they can sell in the U.S. and elsewhere. First of all, who in Congress is leading the charge on the Forest Act? And talk to me a little bit more about what it would do to help stop illegal deforestation. Yeah, uh, the Forest Act is, I think, an incredible legislative tool that would really up the United States' ability to confront 
this illegality and unsustainable commodity trade. So the Forest Act itself was reintroduced in Congress this past December. It is a bipartisan bill. That means it enjoys the support of both Democrats and Republicans in the Senate and the House. Mm -hmm. Uh, So in the Senate, it's led by Senator Schatz of Hawaii and Senator Braun of Indiana. And in the House, it's led by Representative Blumenauer from Oregon and Representative Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania, who really came together, rolled up their sleeves and devised a bill to crack down on uh, the illegal trade of agricultural commodities. So the Forest Act itself does a couple main things. One, it would prohibit agricultural commodities being brought into the U.S. that are produced on illegally deforested lands. So it would simply establish a prohibition to make it illegal to bring in those products. Um, And then second, it would oblige companies that are bringing those products into the U.S. to understand where these products are coming from, be able to trace their supply chains back to the source and take credible action to ensure that illegal deforestation and associated abuses are not part of their supply chains. And I think that's that's really critical. Um, And we've seen success in other areas, in particular around U.S. law that bans imports of illegal timber into the U.S. Uh, And we've seen over the last 15 years with the Lacey Act amendments of 2008, where WWF played a really key role in helping that bill become enacted. We've seen that it's had tremendous impact in terms of obliging um, importers to understand where their plant and wood products are coming from. Um, and studies have shown that gotcha. that, that law has reduced um, imports of illegally sourced wood products by about 32 to 44 percent. So, yeah. So the, there already is a law in the books per, that prevents the uh, import of timber products, wood beams and, and, and pulp and paper products, right? Uh, That's right. Um, into the U.S. that come from illegal deforestation. But this law, the Forest Act, if it was passed, would apply more broadly to any products that are associated with forests and, and land clearing and, and the like. Exactly. It, it takes a similar approach. Um, so the Lacey Act covers timber and plant products uh, like pulp and paper, and the Forest Act would compl- be a complementary approach to covering agricultural products like soy and cattle um, gotcha. that are coming into the United States. Great. So my read of this bill is it it brings both a carrot and a stick approach to engaging companies in this effort. And so it would require companies to stop selling products associated with illegal deforestation, like you just said. And it would also create an incentive structure that actually rewards the best performing companies. So I want to break that down a little bit more for our listeners. And I'd love you to talk a little bit more about the stick side of that approach. And just tell us a little bit about how the requirements under the Forest Act would really work um, and how they would be enforced in particular. Yeah, and I think the strength of the Forest Act is that it really focuses on illegal deforestation. Um, Nobody wants illegal materials or human rights abuses in the products that they are producing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the idea is really to prohibit all illegal goods from coming into the U.S., and that, but then within the Forest Act, have companies and the government really focus in on ensuring that high-risk products coming from high-risk places, that, that's places at a high risk of e- illegal deforestation, are sort of the focus of company efforts and public sector efforts to really reduce illegal deforestation in these supply chains. And so... What the bill would require is that the U.S. government, in consultation with industry and civil society partners, to establish a list of these high-risk countries for illegal deforestation, commodities, and products that are associated with that. So we can really focus in on Mm. attention on where it's needed. And then companies that are importing these higher-risk commodities... uh, would need to declare 
when they bring products into the U.S., that they've made a reasonable effort at assessing and mitigating the risks that these products are sourced from illegally deforested lands. And then importers bringing in products from high-risk places would need to provide additional information about where that product is coming from. So that feels pretty rigorous and feels like it would weed out a lot of bad actors or even just a lot of mistakes that might get made in in the course of companies um, sourcing products and and bringing them uh, to market. As for the sort of incentive or carrot side of of this bill, my understanding is it contains a mechanism to actually reward companies with the best anti-deforestation policies. And I'm curious to know a little bit more about how how that would work, because uh, if, if recent legislative history has taught us anything, it's that policies that provide incentives have a, a better chance of passing. You look at the Inflation Reduction Act and what's that? what that's doing in, in the effort to fight climate change. That's, that's a bill full of incentives for companies to roll out um, clean energy p- products and for people to buy them. Um, so what would the incentive side of the Forest Act look like? Yeah, I think there are two main um, incentives within the bill. And I'll take them in turn, but I will just go back to that illegality piece where it's not defensible to say that we should maintain illegality in supply chain. So I think that there should be Hmm. zero tolerance for illegality and abuses in supply chains. But then, of course, um, you know, transitions take time and resources and effort and there needs to be a balance between this, as you as you say, this sort of carrot and stick approach. So for companies, many of whom are leaders in this space and have made significant investments and significant commitments to removing not just illegal deforestation from supply chains, but deforestation and conversion writ large from their operations. Um, those companies that are leaders and who have set up systems and continue to set up systems, I should be rewarded for that. And so the bill sponsors in consultation with industry have included this trusted trader provision within the legislation so that the U.S. government can establish a more streamlined program for companies, again, who have these credible systems in place to bring products into the country using sort of expedited means and methods, not at a decrease in in terms of expectations. They fully need to comply with the law, but in recognition that, again, we really want to focus um, effort and attention on these highest risk products coming from highest risk places. Um, And we can get significant bang for our buck by doing that. Um, The second incentive is sort of tucked at the end of the legislation, and it would establish a federal procurement preference for deforestation free Hmm. goods. And that I think is an interesting one because it uses federal purchasing power to kind of put the federal government's money um, behind deforestation free goods. And so you're sort of supporting the development of this market and you're giving a leg up to companies and producers who are supplying deforestation free goods to the US government. So they get a little bit of a bump um, there. That's great. Yeah, that trusted trader program almost reminds me of like TSA PreCheck, where uh, for people who go through a, a background check and sort of verify with the government that you are a lower risk for um, any sort of negative activity on, in, an, in an airport or an, uh, on an airplane, you can go through a faster line to get through security a little faster and with you don't have to take your shoes off. <laughs> um, and it seems like it would set up sort of a similar process for companies that can really demonstrate at a high level that they're taking this seriously and that they're going to be a much lower risk for bringing any sort of illegal products into the country. And obviously the, the federal purchasing power provision is great too because the federal government is is a massive purchaser of a lot of products, um, and using the power of that purse is really powerful too. Yeah, and, um, and I will say just to add to that that we're increasingly seeing private sector coming out in support of this type of legislative approach, um, and just in the last few weeks, we saw some of these leading companies who have made 
leading commitments and investments in their own operations coming out in support of the Forest X approach. And so those are four companies, Nestle, Danone, Unilever, and Mars, who have really stepped out to say that this approach is one that is not only important, but really necessary to support them meeting their own commitments. That's great. And, and that's really encouraging for the bill's prospects going forward. So beyond the rewards and the requirements for companies, I know the Forest Act would also provide support for the countries that actually contain these tropical forests, right? So it would provide some support for them to implement their own initiatives to stop illegal deforestation on the ground there. And that that strikes me as really important as well, because as much as we're sitting here in the United States talking about this and talking about working with companies to stamp out illegal deforestation, the forests this is happening in, as you said at the beginning, are not in the United States by and large. And so what kind of support would the bill provide to those countries where most of this activity is actually taking place? Yeah, I think that's a really critical piece. Um, again, because the Forest Act really focuses on supporting countries' own legal frameworks and determination around what is um, illegal deforestation, it really sets the U.S. up to support what producer countries um, are doing to reduce their illegal deforestation in country. And so the bill envisions... Um, you know, diplomatic support and, and assistance from the United States to help producer countries move along a pathway um, from, you know, where they're determined to be at a high risk for illegal deforestation in country to a, a pathway um, of lower risk and getting off that high risk assessment list. So it really envisions a, a partnership approach with countries over the long term to shore up their own in-country rule of law. Great. So just a couple final things on the Forest Act, and I want to get your, your thoughts on one or two other things before we sign off. On the Forest Act, where does the bill currently stand in Congress, and how could listeners of this podcast help to advocate and push for its passage? Yes. So we are now at a critical moment for the bill. It's been introduced in the House and Senate, and this is the moment to really bring on board additional co-sponsors for the legislation. So that's the official sort of support from additional senators to stand alongside Senators Braun and Schatz, and then the House side, bringing on board co-sponsors to stand with Representatives Blumenauer and Fitzpatrick. Um, so we do have an online activist alert that's live right now through WWF's Action Center, where you can join the community of, I think there are over 11 million activists now within the WWF network. Um, and join them in, in calling on members of Congress in both the House and Senate to take action and support the Forest Act. This really is a critical window of time to move this bill out of committees and then uh, through the House and Senate to the president's desk. That's great. That's really encouraging. And we'll be sure to put a link to that Action Center page where people can sign on in the show notes for this episode. So people can just click there. Just one last follow up on, on the Forest Act before we switch to something else. Um, you know, I think we, we hear all the time about good ideas in Congress that never actually become law, right? So I wonder if you can just tell us why you're hopeful that this bill might be an exception. It's a good question. And certainly, D.C. can be an exciting place um, at any time. Um, I think this bill is important because it has bipartisan support in both chambers. You know, we have support from key U.S. producers like the U.S. Cattlemen's Association um, some of the companies I mentioned earlier signaling support. Um, I think we're seeing this increased attention to the role that forests play in terms of both climate solution, nature solution, and being so tied with economic health and human well-being. Um, yeah. And again, you know, going back to the anti-corruption 
and sort of security linkages. I think for each of those reasons, there are a number of, of different entry points that policymakers can come to this issue from and see that this is one that really resonates for their states, their districts, their businesses, and U.S. interests, uh, both in the U.S. and around the world. Okay, well, thanks for sort of bringing us up to speed on the Forest Act. I think it's super interesting, would be super impactful if we can get it over the finish line, whether that's this year or in a couple years from now, we'll we'll keep fighting that fight and and getting our listeners engaged. Um, Before I let you go, I want to pivot to one or two other things and just touch base briefly on some other legislative priorities that I know you're tracking really closely. And I want to start with the Farm Bill, which is something we devoted a whole episode of this podcast to last year. Um, It's due to be reauthorized. It's the primary vehicle for updating U.S. agricultural policies. And, you know, a year after we first talked about it, that bill still hasn't been reauthorized. So I wanted to ask you where things stand on the Farm Bill. Yeah, that in some ways is a a million dollar question um, right now. As you noted, this is the major piece of legislation governing U.S. food and agriculture policy. Um, It's critical for U.S. producers and millions of American families. It did expire last year and was reauthorized for one year. That authorization expires in a few months at the end of September. And so we are we are waiting to see how the chairs and ranking members of the Senate and House Ag Committees try to work together, hopefully in a bipartisan way, to really continue investments in moving the needle and really moving the ball forward on climate and nature, smart agriculture that also delivers for rural communities and for producers, ranchers, farmers, and foresters Mm -hmm. all across the country. Great. So last question before I let you go, Stephanie, what other bills are you tracking right now, whether that's in Congress or in state legislatures, and what else should our listeners know about? Uh, So that's a great question. I do want to talk about just briefly Um, a state level bill that we are tracking on and engaging with. And that's a new, newly reintroduced bill. It's called the Trees Act, the Tropical Rainforest and Economic and Environmental Sustainability Act that's been introduced in the New York State Legislature. Uh, That would really, you know, going back to our, um, the point earlier about using the power of government purchasing to really create Mm. a market for sustainably and legally sourced goods, this New York bill would establish a tropical deforestation free procurement requirement in the state of New York um, and would put New York state really at the forefront of state and even U.S. federal action to really promote um, businesses and jobs that are not dependent on tropical deforestation. So we saw that bill pass through the New York legislature last year. Um, It was unfortunately not signed into law, uh, but the bill sponsors are back at it again. And um, we are hopeful that this bill, with support from listeners, will once again swiftly move through the legislature and um, move to the governor's desk for signature by the end of this year. Great. That's interesting. And that's that's great to know that um, in parallel to federal efforts to pass the Forest Act and, and use federal purse strings to incentivize good behavior on this front that states are taking action to. And New York is obviously uh, a, a very populous state, very powerful uh, in terms of its purchasing power. So great to hear that there's progress on that front, too. Absolutely. So, Stephanie, I think we can wrap there for today. Thank you so much for bringing us up to speed on the Forest Act and the Farm Bill and and legislation in New York. This is a great conversation, and I think it's really exciting to know that there's some momentum around efforts to keep forests intact and to make sure that illegal deforestation isn't contributing to products that we all use in our daily lives and, uh, you know, really trying to get our hands around that and create a better world for, for ourselves and our children. So thank you for walking us through it. Thanks, Seth, for having me. 
That's a wrap for today's episode. Thanks again to Stephanie for taking us through the weeds on the Forest Act and those other legislative priorities. As she said, forests are one of our most important allies in the climate fight, but we can't count on their help if illegal deforestation runs rampant. I hope all our listeners will take a moment to use the links in the show notes to send a message to their elected officials that it's time to hold companies accountable and ensure that we're only importing deforestation-free products into the U.S. market. Together, let's keep building a more sustainable future.